everybody. Thank you so much for coming to the Open Research Institute FPGA stand up for the 17th of October 2023. At this meeting, we go round the table and we talk about what we've done, um, what we plan on doing, uh, if we have any roadblocks, anything that's that's blocking us, because um, my job is to make sure that you get people called in to help you out. And then if you need any resources, if there's uh, software, hardware, uh, financial resources that are needed. And this meeting is recorded and put on YouTube. All right, so let's uh, start off with Paul. So tell us tell us uh, your report and, um, and your thoughts about uh, Remote Lab. Okay, well, Remote Lab has been pretty quiet this week, supporting some uh, some development uh, with uh, MATLAB and so forth remotely, but otherwise uh, idle. Nothing new going on. No blockers. No no needs for resources that I'm aware of at the moment. So short report. Well, short short but good. Thank you very much for all the help. Uh, so yeah, it's been been lots of simulation and uh, uh, not nothing over the air uh, that I know of. Um, uh, some some interest and and some shipping has happened. So we have uh, shipped some hardware to a PhD student in order for them to duplicate part of remote labs, and they'll also be taking advantage of the equipment uh, and answering some some questions. So that was some very good outreach uh, educationally. So that that happened. All right, James, you're up. Hello, everyone. Uh, just reporting for this week that we're looking for a more full deployment of the remote lab down here in our preferred location within the next month. Uh, but if we if we encounter any difficulties with that, particularly with the environment that we're setting up, we've got another location ready that should be able to take care of everything. So we're looking forward to that. OK, that sounds that sounds really uh, unexpectedly good. Um, I look forward to more. More details on that. It need anything? Uh, nothing in particular currently. We're just keeping up our work, trying to balance between, you know, I'm still in, in college and the other individual here working on Remote Lab South is still working. So we're trying to balance between that, but we're making good progress. Okay. Be good to good to hear some details and uh, photographs would be great for our newsletter. So keep that in mind. All right, Ken, you have the floor. Um, let's see, I've been uh, just continuing to read up on uh, polyphase filters and understanding uh, the theory behind them. I don't really have a whole lot of progress to report, though. Well, learning is a ton of progress. This stuff isn't easy. So that's <laughs> so thank you very much. Uh but but when you say progress, you probably mean that there's no code to show yet, right? Yeah. I'm not in the coding phase. So. Okay. And and for those following along, the the code base that we're looking to to renovate and, and kind of lift up and, and use is the Theseus cores, uh, which you can find it's uh on GitLab and and also um duplicated over to, to GitHub, and then we've we forked a copy of that uh, to the Open Research Institute repo so that we can work with it and and you know make all the mistakes and then get it get it working and then and feedback to the Theseus course team. So we just like to recognize their achievement with the polyphase filter bank. Uh, and we we got a copy of uh, the paper that was the the main uh, paper from from Fred Harris at all. Uh, that that was used in order to to write the easiest cores. Uh, been, it's been very helpful, so I've been working through it. And then I have some slides to show uh, that kind of summarize our particular prototype. Um, so we're going to take the the work in the code base, and that also is outlined by this paper, and then make a you know make our make our own prototype and and test it. So so I have a little bit there to to share. All right. Any any other questions or any, anybody need anything um, before I dive into Neptune and and the polyphase work? Okay. So let's see. I'll go ahead and attempt to 
share the screen, always an adventure. Okay, can you see a purple screen? Yes, I see. All right, thank you. That's a tremendous reassurance. Okay, so what you're seeing is the title slide for our uh, FPGA meetup presentation today. So, so what I did is is tried to to sum up some of the questions and progress that's been going over on over uh, the past week for for you all. All right, so on Neptune, which is our open source drone protocol, so it's intended for aerospace for for drones. Um, and and any other aerospace application. Uh, that's what's it's OFDM based. Um, there, it has its own repository, which is linked here in the slides uh, in a little bit. Uh, but this week we had a question from TLAC uh, who says, in my graduate OFDM or orthogonal frequency division multiplexing coursework, OFDM is the is is the basic protocol that we're using for Neptune. In his OFDM coursework, he's encountered the benefits of using pulse shaping filters like raised root cosine, both in transmit and receive side to mitigate inter symbol interference or ISI, and it lets you occupy less bandwidth, et cetera. And lots of designs incorporate this. We, we do this a lot in digital communication. So we have a filter that deliberately messes up our transmit signal, our nice, you know, reasonable to a human looking transmit signal, what we do is we filter it with a raised root cosine, a ringing sort of pulse. Um, we do this on transmit and the receive. When those two filters, the effects of those two filters are added together, so you transmit and you receive, you add them together, that's the raised root cosine effect. It really does help your signal um, and it reduces what's called inner symbol interference. So this is a classic technique in digital communications that he's talking about. So he's saying, okay, I get it. Many designs seem to incorporate this, but I don't see any pulse shaping in the FlexLink Neptune design document. Can you help me out understand why this is not needed or not used? Doesn't the recipe of OFDM need one? And so the specification that we're talking about is here. That's the link. So if you go to GitHub and you go to Open Research Institute's project page, lots of lots of repos there, you'll find the Neptune repo and under FlexLink docs is the, is a docx file. And that's the, that's the specification that Tilak is talking about. So Leonard, who's the lead for the project answered, he says, yeah, there's going to be a windowed RRC filter on the output, which is the typical RRC. You know, you, you mess up your signal in a way that, that reduces interference that helps you. So it's somewhat non-intuitive, but that's just the way it's done. And there's there's lots of good explanations out there for this particular thing. And then he went on and he says, I believe you can consider each of the FFT bins to have its own RSC filter and the filter you're talking about where? So he wanted to know like, which, which one are you talking about? So Talak was mainly talking about symbol shaping for the whole symbol or pulse shaping for the, you know, for, for each transmitted symbol that we do. And I, I'm thinking that would handle the whole OFDM symbol. And that's pretty much handled like any other pulse shaping like we've been talking about. So he, this brought up a whole category of work that's in OFDM where you filter the actual subcarriers. And the reason why you might want to do that is because you may want to have, you may have what's called narrowband interference or NBI. And jammers and interference, this is an area that I know that to lock is interested in. Uh, so I, I want to go ahead and talk a little bit about that. So when we talk about OFDM, these are just my personal notes so that I can keep everything straight in my head. Um, how do you do it? So you have these input symbols. So we call them X of K, K meaning your index for for your for the actual symbol. So think about a, a large number of of symbols that you're handling all at once. And you're going to read them in, in a list. You know, I think we're all accustomed to just just chucking symbols out the door one at a time. Like QPSK, a QPSK uh, signal may just be, you know, you have a symbol, that the, some sort of information that you're trying to transmit, and you are chucking it out the door one at a time. OFDM is a little bit different because we take a we take the 
that stream assembles, we turn them into a parallel buffer. So we gather them all up in a line, in a row, like a marching band, and then they all get sent out to um, to be modulated. So they're all sent all at once in a row. So a little different. So this is done with something called a IDFT or IFFT, which is inverse uh, Fourier transform or discrete Fourier transform. And so that's how you kind of accomplish this. You turn this, this parallel set of complex frequencies into um, complex time, so a time sequence, and that goes to the digital analog converter, it becomes a transmitted signal. On the other side, when you receive it, you run it through an analog to digital converter, and you do a DFT, discrete Fourier transform, or a Fourier transform, and then you get back into this parallel set of, of frequencies, which are frequently expressed as, um, uh, yeah, you know, okay. So they're complex frequencies, and you can you can you can use you can express them as QAM or quadrature amplitude modulation symbols. So that's kind of the shorthand way of of doing it. So if you're going, what wait, QAM is what you send out over the air, okay? But in OFDM, you can use QAM to represent your complex frequencies to represent your symbols. So it's very flexible kind of use of QAM. Uh, on the right hand side of the page, it's kind of just restated in a more simple way that you're using QAM to represent your complex frequencies, you're sending it to an IDFT, and you're, you know, that's your encoding, you're using an encoding. And then when you're looking at the, when you're looking at the frequencies lined up, um, there is a really neat thing. So along the bottom of both of these, these uh, pages is like how I remembered how it's, how it's represented. And you go from k equals zero, the, the lowest index, all the way up to k equal n minus one, with n being the, the total number. And uh, the maximum frequency is actually in the middle. And you if you're familiar with you know samples per symbol and you know, or samples uh, per per rotation all the way around your your two pi, uh, that's what you're seeing on on the left. Um so there's some trickery here where you actually do reverse around the uh, uh, the rotation. Um, so if you're interested in this, there there's a lot of good stuff out there and and this is you know this is a very compact representation. If it's confusing, don't feel bad. It's confusing to a lot of us that actually uh, do this for a living. Um, but this is a very compact representation of the entire sort of OFDM mindset. Okay, so you got these quadrature amplitude modulated represented free complex frequencies that you're sending into your IFFT. You get a time series coming out. You do a bandpass modulator. It's running at two times that frequency because you have now you have a complex real and imaginary. So it's just two different ways of of drawing it. Um, and once you get that, you've got all of these subcarriers. And each subcarrier, you might have 128 subcarriers on your OFDM, and each one of those subcarriers is a little slice of your frequency band. That's that's kind of the the thing that we're dealing with here. All of those subcarriers, those sliced up things, that marching band moving forward. Each individual musician is a subcarrier. Let's say one of those people in the marching band has got a really rough bit of field to march over. And everybody else is doing okay, but they've got they've got something messed up. They've got holes and ruts and and mud, and they're they're going to have a harder time. Maybe they even drop out. So this is sort of like that subcarrier. You know, this is a broadband signal, but we have a narrow band interferer. We have somebody that's taken out or sniping out one of our marchers, and uh, you know, if we know about it, if we know which subcarrier is taken out, then we can we can account for that. We can mitigate that. So let's say that our F1 here, we have F0, F2, and F3, but F1 has some, some interferer or jammer. So we can apply a filter to this particular subcarrier, this particular value in order to compensate. And that's kind of, that's so that's the situation that we're talking about. Like if you have a narrow band interferer, part of your signal's notched out, what do you do? Okay, so a narrow band interference, no FDM. There's a couple of approaches here, at least three. And they depend on where it is being performed. 
So, so we saw where we take essentially frequency domain signals. We take our tones, our frequency encoded stuff with that QAM signal. Well, we can process all the way as far back as there. We can say there's some frequency domain processing. Now this would be at the receiver. Uh, we can process in the time domain at the receiver, or we can process the frequency domain at the transmitter, right? So either, all of these are actually places where you can put the filter. So to answer Talak's question, it's, you know, he's asked something like, okay, well, where's the filtering for, for this? And I'm kind of assuming, oh, I think you probably mean, probably more interested in subcarrier filtering. Guess what? You can do it at several different stages and each of them have trade-offs. So what, what can you do? Well, you can say we have a near band interferer or a jammer, somebody that's attacking us, right? You can reconstruct that near band interference by predicting it. So you can successively predict it and you can subtract it in the frequency domain, but you need a really accurate estimate of the this near band interferer and it's a priori, meaning you know beforehand. So you know before you're you know, you know your before you know about it before uh, you have to do all the math. So, how do you do this? Maybe you listen first. You you he realize that there is going to be a jammer where you are or some sort of noise source where you are. You characterize it in the absence of your signal. Then, when your signal comes along, you're able to just subtract out that particular uh, interferer. Or you can just simply zero out your subcarrier. You can say, gosh, I got 10, 24 of them like we do in Neptune. So we have a jammer uh, at at uh, number 20. Why don't we just set it to zero? There is, a, there is a reason that you should be careful doing that because the FFT has a windowing process where we've taken shortcuts in the math. It's not, per, it's not, it's never perfect, especially with digital circuits and, and embedded processing. And this may affect your adjacent subcarriers. So you have to balance it out you're going to lose more than just this one if you set your subcarrier to zero. And eh, if it's just one subcarrier, you're losing no problem. So it's 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 just a is it is it worth the price of just zeroing out? And you also lose that data too. So you have to be okay with losing the data. So how about looking at the time domain before the DFT and the receiver? So your time signal that you're receiving, ADC, it's processed now before you turn it back into a frequency domain subcarriers, well, you can just put a notch filter there. And you can use linear prediction to do this, to build that notch filter, but only if you have flat fading. So the channel type, like, is it flat fading? Is it not flat fading? Like what's going on in your channel? If, if you got ordinary flat fading, this technique works. So that's a pretty complex solution, but the complexity buys you some improvement in the spectral damage or leaking. So compared to like setting it to zero, you've jammed setting it to zero. If you can afford, if you have the right conditions, flat fading, you can do the linear prediction. You can notch it out in the time domain and it works better. Okay, so what does Neptune do already? Well, there's a section, it, it, I think it interleaves, that was my understanding, is that we already do interleaving and we use forward error correction. So we already kind of add extra data to reconstruct signals that are damaged by noise and interleaving spreads out your data. The best way to describe inter, interleaving that I know how to say is, let's say you have a book. So you have a paperback book and somebody is going to uh, yank out 100 pages of it. Like they're gonna just rip out 100 pages. And you're like, wait a minute, that's a lot of data that we're losing. Okay, well, what if all the pages were were reordered, like your, your book, before you allowed it to be damaged, you could just mix up all the pages. If you mixed up all the pages, then you have pages uh, that were right together by each other are now spread out over, over the book. And somebody rips out 100 pages, when you put it back together, you're just losing a page every now and then. And you can sort of kind of limp along as a reader. Well, let's say you interleaved every paragraph. Okay, now you're just missing every paragraph every now and then. Okay, that's even better. Let's say you interleaved it down to the sentence level. Okay, now we're just losing every sentence spreader out. You know, like the, the attacker thinks that they're getting 100 pages together, but you've mixed it up and you can decode it because you know the order. 
And you could even do this down to the letter. So we all know as readers, if we lose a letter every now and then, we're good. We can almost get back a perfect copy of the book because our brains will correct, you know, the, and, and that's the basic idea for interleaving, that the level of interleaving, like how much complexity can you tolerate? How much do you have to work with? And in Neptune, we have quite a bit of potential interleaving that we can do given the number of channels. So it works up to a point, this whole interleaving in FEC. There are limits to it. Um, the interesting thing about Neptune is that the interleaving section of the spec is actually blank. So it looks like it's pretty clear that there's interleaving <laughs> that's supposed to happen, but it's not specified yet, uh, which which I didn't really notice uh, until until I went hunting for uh, the answer to Talak's question. So interleaving and FEC handle all of the low ISR stuff or interference to noise ratio. So it handles it up to a level. You still might have to zero out channels that are really crushed to get any more performance out of this. Um, but for the vast majority of cases, the interleaving and forward error correction uh, will, will defeat narrow band interference. So the three things that we can do, we can subtract out the nearband interference if we know about it in advance or have some sort of sensor or receiver, you know, without any other signals, like we're just listening. We can zero out the subcarrier or and we can interleave an FEC. And these can be combined. Um, so yeah, like I said, the interleaving section of Neptune is currently blank. Our FEC is LDPC. Um, the signal field uses a convolutional encoder. So it's a one-third rate convolutional encoder. The reason for that is that the signal field uh, for signaling data, for like telling you sort of the overhead uh, stuff about the, the the link, you need to get that information out very quickly. So a convolutional code looks like it's a better bet. This is the usual trade-off. Your, your payload is in LDPC. The latency on decoding that is longer, but you need to know information about your, your signal. So the signal field or control field um, can be recovered more quickly. It doesn't work as good as LDPC, but it's uh, it's also transmitted, I think, with BPSK, which which gives you gain. So it's uh, you know faster, but but lower bit rate and louder signal versus you could pack in a lot more bits and get the same performance, uh, but the latency is longer. But that there's things that you need to know in the signal field that let you set up for the payload. This is also a very common technique, and and uh, it all you can also see this in opulent voice. There is also rate matching, and I know about this in theory, uh, and I've learned a little bit more over the past week. So there's this rate matching, uh, jiggery stuff in in Neptune, and that's because you have to repeat your encoded bits to fill up the OFDM signal because the rate's fixed, and I. I think this is different than Hyperia, where we let the bit rate wander, you know, so it's just the bit rate changes with respect to the uh, coding and modulation changes. And I'm going to have to double check with Leonard. So I think that the, this whole rate matching thing is because they have a fixed bit rate. But um, maybe don't quote me on that. So I'll, I'll track that down to try to learn more. Okay, so there's lots to do on Neptune. Maybe fill out the interleaving section of the spec. And we're already using LDPC forward error correction. We could do narrowband interference mitigation, which is anti-jamming that can be done at several places in the architecture, both in the receiver and the transmitter. All these places require some sort of filter, and there's trade-offs for each one of them. Okay, so it's what I know about going on with HIFRIA. So we're putting together a prototype based on the Theseus course code that Ken talked about. If you're interested in helping with this, uh, contact any board member or Ken Easton to participate, and the code will be published at the High for IEA project page. Here's a real high-level diagram or basics of the prototype we're trying to put together. We have 10 megahertz to work with. Six, we, we're going to go with 64 channels. The um, width or center to center is or F delta is that frequency over the number of paths or the number of channels, 156 kilohertz. We're gonna set uh, set this like, we're gonna use it like it's uh, in the paper 
for communications channels and not as a spectrum analyzer style. So this is 0.8 FS divided by M, which gives us 125 kilohertz uh, data bandwidth. And then the rate or the multi-rate outcome is that that channel, that down sample channel um, is going to be 250 kilohertz sample rate. And this gives us two samples per symbol, which allows us to be able to do the coherent demodulation. So we need to be able to do that uh, in the receiver. So so that's that's the direction we're going. On the right hand side of the screen, there's um, from that paper, which is magnet magneted up there to the to the whiteboard, and and that's just a quick summary of the example, uh, somewhat equivalent example in the in the paper, and the paper was linked uh, last week, uh, thanks to to Rick, uh, and and it's been very useful. So we got a clean copy of it with no redactions uh, through ResearchGate. It's just a close up of the of the snapshot. So it gave us a lot of confidence that we can pull this off. And that's it. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing and I'll I'll put the I'll put all these images and slides up uh, on the recording so that uh, folks can can look at it if they want to correct anything that I got wrong uh, or add to it, then that would be very welcome. All right, so so that's it. That's all I know about this week. Uh, the other Another report is that we were asked to participate in a CubeSat um, meetup with the University of, of Victoria in Canada, and that went really well. That was a, a very good meetup. Uh, thank you very much to, to Dr. Estefas for, for introducing us to the team. And it turns out that um, several folks that we, that we already are, are trying to help and work with in Canada are also acquainted with, with the team. So they were, they were also involved in in the meeting. So we were able to, to have a a, a pretty good lineup. Uh, and they're interested in using DVBS too for their downlink. This is going to be on uh, lower frequency than five gig. Uh, but uh, really looking forward to to helping out that particular team. And they're they're looking at our DVB S two encoder uh, by Swato. Um, we target Xilinx, and they have started out using uh, Cyclone, uh, but the the techniques are in HDL are still the same. So uh, we are we're offering all of, of what we've done to them uh, in support. All right, that's it. Okay, any any questions or or comments or anything uh, that I might have missed or need to attend to. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, let's uh, continue all of this on on Slack. And uh, if you're if you're listening and would like to to follow along, everybody is welcome. Uh, we have a getting started page at uh, www.openresearch.institute. If you look for the getting started link, uh, then you can join the announcements email list uh, or any of the other lists in our in our lineup. And uh, it'll give you instructions for how to get get on Slack, which is probably the best way uh, to talk to us or or to get involved with any of the many projects we do. All right, thank you, everybody. I'll go ahead and close it down, and uh, I'll see you next week. We'll have plenty more to talk about.